All right, everyone, we will get started. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for taking the time to attend my presentation today. It'll be about uh, 50 to 55 minutes. Um, and most importantly, uh, if you can stay on this presentation until the end, uh, that's great. Um, and if you are looking for a learning credit, you will have to stay on until the very end. Uh, when I'm done my presentation, I'll let everybody know. And then our marketing team will, will log out. And then when they log out on their end, that will record everyone who still will kind of log in. That way, uh, you can get your learning credit if that's something you're interested in. Uh, um, something else to know, everyone's on mute. Um, Jim, the past PA, uh, my, my colleague in Winnipeg, is helping me out today doing the Q&A. So if you go to the bottom middle of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. Put all your questions in there, and please do not put them in the chat section. Um, in terms of getting the PDF format of this presentation, uh, when it's all said and done, that can easily be done. Just send myself uh, an email or, or anyone else at Sika, really, and, and they'll make sure that you get that presentation. So today's uh, presentation is focusing on concrete repair and protection. Uh, the image is actually of the, the Calgary Ring Road expansion here in Calgary, uh, which is where I'm based out of. So my name is Adam DeVelter, and I'm a technical sales rep uh, for Sika Canada, working specifically within our commercial construction division. Uh, we have a number of divisions within Sika, and I'll get to that in a couple slides. Um, again, my email's at the bottom there. And so my sales territory is southern Alberta, so it's about Red Deer South for, for the province. So our agenda today is going to be looking at Sika at a glance, uh, talking about the concrete surface preparation that's required in order to successfully apply a repair mortar, talk about the different repair mortar selections from Sika that are out there, and then finally finish things off with a discussion on protective coatings. So Sika at a glance. We've been around for over a century. Uh, we were established in Switzerland in 1910, uh, and from there we've grown to be a multinational company. Um, at our core, we still feel like we're a specialty chemical company uh, with a presence in five continents uh, and in a presence in over 100 different countries. Uh, within those 100 countries, we have over 20,000 uh, employees working globally for SICA, uh, as well as we have 200 production plants within those 100 uh, countries. Uh, within Canada, we're obviously you know, a much smaller um, uh, snapshot of, of SICA Global. So we have over 400 uh, Canadian employees working for Seeking Canada. We have sites across the country, uh, strategically located. So in BC, we're in Surrey. Uh, in Alberta, we're located in Edmonton. Um, in Ontario, we've got locations in Cambridge, uh, Mississauga, Brantford. Um, then we have a number of facilities throughout Quebec with our head office being in Point Claire. So that's uh, just uh, an outlying area of Montreal. So within each of these locations, we have offices, warehousing, manufacturing, we'll do R&D. Um, they do serve as, as regional distribution hubs. So although the previous slide highlighted how large Sika is globally, uh, we still see ourselves as a, as a local partner offering you know, local representation and kind of local uh, products and, and R&D as well. As I mentioned in, in my first slide, you know, I work for commercial construction, but we have more than one division uh, at Sika Canada. We actually now have seven. Uh, this slide's really only high, highlighting six, but I'll just briefly go over them. Uh, we've got uh, a concrete admixer division. So we're selling admixers like set retarders, plasticizers, water reducers, things like that. Two companies like Burnco, Rolling Mix, Lafarge, uh, Inland, uh, things like that. We also have a waterproofing division. So we do get involved with parking deck membranes, balcony coatings, uh, below grade waterproofing, blindside waterproofing. So we can help you out with, with all of those needs. Uh, roofing, we're very well known for our PVC roofing products. I know here in Calgary, uh, like where our, our where the Flames play, our hockey team uh, is at the Saddle Dome, and that has a Sika roof on it in Edmonton. The new arena there has a Sika roof. Uh, I have in Toronto, the, the Sky Dome is actually, well, I refer to it as a Sky Dome because I grew up there, but that was uh, re-roofed with a PVC roof, uh, PVC Sika roof uh, this past summer. Uh, we also have a ceiling limb bonding group. Uh, you're probably pretty familiar with the term Sikaflex. That's some of the, the joint sealants in my division, which again is commercial construction. However, we also sell products for the uh, for the industrial market as well. So, you know, boat manufacturers, bus manufacturers, a lot of uh, car park manufacturers as well. Uh, concrete refurbishment is what we're focusing on today. Obviously, we, we make those products. And then Sika flooring is also very large. 
Um, and then the seventh division that, that should be on here, but it's not, is uh, Shaw Creek Tunneling and Mining. So that's a new kind of exciting division for us because it, it's very different, but it, it does highlight a lot of synergies that, that we have. Um, so we, we've just expanded our offerings even more. So that kind of, that seventh division um, is really coming from this kind of acquisition of this company that we brought into the secret family, which is King. Uh, they're a well-established Canadian company uh, founded in, in Ontario in the 1920s. Uh, from there, it has grown to be a very large company operating really globally, but still with a heavy Canadian uh, focus and presence. So they bring to the table, you know, masonry products, concrete repair, uh, mortars, and I'll highlight three later in the presentation, as well as a host of grouts. Um, and again, shock creek tunneling and mining products. Uh, another strategic um, kind of acquisition or again, company we brought into the Sika family is MSEAL. Uh, they're more of a, an American company predominantly, but they have been in the Canadian market for decades. Uh, so now in 2020, my division uh, is helping to support the, the sale and the, the technical aspect of MSEAL products. What they are, are preformed expansion joints. So again, you're probably pretty familiar with, with Sika's offerings and, and Sika Flex, I would assume at a minimum. Um, so those uh, polyurethane joint sealants are great for sealing joints that are maybe you know quarter of an inch or half an inch wide, all the way up to an inch and a half, uh, maybe even two inches at, at a stretch. But when you get to that kind of inch and a half plus uh, expansion joint, that's where you really want to use a preformed expansion joint like MSEAL. So if you ever have questions about those, just reach out to your local uh, commercial construction seeker rep and we'll, we'll gladly help you out. So to get in, into today's uh, main presentation, you know, we like to use the analogy of maintaining your vehicle, right? We all, a lot of us have vehicles and we know the maintenance that goes into them, you know, whether it's an oil change, whether it's detailing, some rust that's forming, uh, changing tires, you know, uh, things along those lines. If you don't maintain your vehicle, you know, obviously this is a dramatized photo, but it will start to go downhill. And once it does, it will go downhill fast. So we feel like concrete is the same. Um, if if you're not maintaining it and staying on top of it, um, it will fall apart and it will be a big cost to, to, uh, to demo it and replace it. So why does concrete need to be repaired in the first place? Why can't I just pour uh, a concrete slab, for example, and it, and it lasts for centuries? Well, there are kind of four forces that we're going to highlight that are acting on concrete to, to erode it and damage it. First is mechanical damage due to, you know, it can be impact, uh, abrasion and wear, overloading, movement, vibration. These are all uh, forces that are mechanically acting on concrete to, to damage it. Secondly, you've got uh, chemical damage due to exposure to chemicals like sulfates, salts, acids. Uh, throughout Canada, there's kind of hot spots uh, for, for sulfate attack. I know kind of in the Edmonton area within Alberta, it, it's a big concern, as well as uh, areas in Southern Alberta as well. Um, so sulfate resistant repair mortars, maybe you need to use something like that because of the, the ground in your area. It could be alkali aggregate or alkali silicate reaction issues as well as uh, bacterial or biological action. A good example of this would be wastewater treatment chambers or storage tanks. I was actually dealing with an engineer this week um, and she was providing some photos to me where um, they decided not to use a tank lining and they were storing uh, wastewater. It was within, in the wastewater treatment process. And so because of the H2S gas, um, there was about an inch of concrete that had been eroded and there was severe concrete damage. And that was all due to bacterial and biological action. So that there's an ex uh, you know, a recent example of uh, why that concrete now needs to be repaired. Physical damage. So there's a third uh, force that's kind of acting on concrete. Um, that could be thermal movement, freestyle action. Um, I don't know if everyone's aware, but you know, Calgary is a prime example of, of where we have a lot of freestyle damage because of our constant um, changing temperatures and, and cycling uh, that way. Uh, it's still going to be an issue throughout the rest of Canada, but, but I know, you know from personal experience, Calgary is really bad for that. Uh, we've got efflorescence or leaching, corrosion of the reinforcing steel, uh, shrinkage are all physical damage uh, issues to concrete. Uh, fourth issue would be, you know, in a sense, not really the concrete's fault, but it's more of uh, how it was applied. So you've got errors and deficiencies on the construction site, which can lead to uh, too little concrete cover, honeycombing or incorrect concrete levels. Uh, all of these errors when the concrete's being placed 
can lead to future concrete repairs that now have to be done. Just want to highlight a couple photos here of examples of inadequate uh, concrete cover over reinforced steel, um, as well as a couple other um, issues here. Um, got concrete damage at a stairway that obviously is going to need to be repaired. Um, some honeycombing issues. Uh, so they've got, you know, they've severely uh, misconsolidated this concrete. And so it's all the aggregates kind of piled up right here and that'll need to be fixed. Um, another photo of, of a similar type of application. Some more photos just to kind of get uh, everyone on the call thinking of, of times in the past uh, when they've seen concrete damage or, or to highlight things uh, down the road when they see them. Some severe concrete damage due to corrosion of the reinforcing steel this is uh, a park aid application, so a suspended slab, and you can see some of those post tensioning cables uh, kind of hanging loose there. Uh, chloride induced damage carbonation-induced damage. Um, how, how would you define a concrete repair process? Well, this is how, how we think of it. So first and foremost, you need to replace defective concrete. Um, in that process, or during that process, you, you need to make sure that the product is restoring structural integrity, uh, restoring durability, restoring aesthetic appearance, and finally restoring geometric appearance. Um, just think back to that, that stairway slide uh, where uh, you had the, the bottom of that stairway uh, broken off. There's no point fixing that if it aesthetically, geometrically doesn't make sense and look good. So you need to make sure all these things are done when you're doing a concrete repair. So key stages in concrete repair. Stage one, uh, as I already mentioned, is going to be the removal of damaged concrete. And we'll get into some of the specific tools and ways you can uh, remove that damaged concrete. Second way is going to be substrate and steel preparation. So if you do have corroded rebar, you need to clean that up during the patching process um, once it's exposed. And then you need to get that surface SSD. And we'll get into that uh, in a second here, what that term SSD means. Then you need to obviously apply a repair mortar. And then finally, you need to finish it so that it, it looks proper and that you've restored that aesthetic appearance and the, the, the geometry of the area. And then, you know, really importantly, you need to cure it. And we'll get to that as well. So. At SECA, we do uh, defer to uh, I cry a lot. So that, that's how we pronounce the, or personally, that's how I pronounce the, uh, the acronym. So it stands for International Concrete Repair Institute. And on our technical data sheets, we'll refer to, to, to I cry a couple times, and, and a lot of other manufacturers will do the same. So in terms of removal geometry, that kind of column on the left here, this is typically what, you know, a concrete repair looks like. You, you have damage kind of all over the place and it's not simple clean lines. But this column here, this is what you have to do in order to uh, apply an effective repair mortar patch, we'll say. So we are expecting, and, and I try again, we'll, we'll expect this as well, is that you are saw cutting to define your patch here. There's no point in trying to apply a repair mortar to something that looks like this. You need to actually saw cut it, create simple lines um, so that you can be effectively bonding this repair mortar to the to the good concrete. Um, and so yes, you will have to remove the, the we'll say bad concrete here, uh, the deteriorated concrete, as well as you will be forced to um, remove uh, good concrete as well. This is a, an example here. Um, obviously, the concrete didn't quite fail in that perfect kind of T shape, but he did uh, approach the repair mortar um, in the patch in the right manner and he did saw cut the patch to find it uh, prepped it and then applied his repair mortar just some kind of removal geometry photos here you know top one would be partial depth repair bottom one would be full depth right where you have to form it up underneath to apply a repair mortar some more photos here of, of beam repairs again some photos here of a column repair just trying to you know get people thinking of, of what a repair area might might look like. This is also an important slide. Um, you need to, when, you're, when you've got reinforced concrete, you do need to remove concrete to undercut and expose the reinforcing steel and provide uniform repair depth. You need to get in behind that steel. And the next slide will kind of show that better as well. So A, you're getting your repair mortar to bond and kind of hold, hold on to that reinforcing uh, steel. And then B, uh, you need to make sure it's completely clean, right? There's no point seeing that the top side of it cleaning off the, the rust and then the underside still has rust on it. 
to be a good example here, right? You can see someone using, you know, what, what's supposed to look like, uh, or supposed to be an illustration of, of sandblasting, right? So they're getting in behind, they've completely undercut and exposed the, the back of the rebar so that they can shoot that, that sandblast medium um, and it'll kind of bounce off the surface right here and then clean this area here. Um, again, now we'll get into another iCry, you know, kind of terminology that Sika will reference on all of our data sheets under the surface preparation heading, which will be at the kind of top of the second page. And that is uh, CSP profiles. So CSP is an acronym for concrete surface profiles. Uh, numerically, we'll, we'll categorize them from one to 10. One being, you know, it'll almost be like a broom finish type surface. Um, and then 10, you'll see exposed aggregate. Um, you can purchase these iCry um, kind of examples here that you can see here. Obviously, you know, you can purchase your own, you can go online, uh, we, we can kind of get them for you and sell them to you if that's something that, that you want. This would be a one, and then all of our repair borders will we'll, uh, say again, right on our data sheet under surface preparation that you need at least a six. I don't know how well that's kind of showing up, um, but you need at least a six, and then this would be an example of a 10, right? We'll kind of get into the, the methods on how you would get concrete after it's been finished to look like a CSP of six at a minimum, again, for our repair mortars, that, that's the requirements. So in order to, to prepare the concrete, you can use, you know, uh, an abrasion method, uh, impact, like a chipping hammer um, with, with a chisel bit on the end, it could be impact this way, like scarifying, it could be erosion, like sandblasting, or it could be pulverization through, uh, through shot blasting. So shot blasting is a popular one to get a CSP of at least three to four. Again, it's not quite enough for our repair mortars, but I, I choose to highlight it because it is such a common method. Um, and it is the method and the go-to method for preparing the concrete before you apply like a balcony waterproofing coat coating, which Sika will have, or our parking deck membranes as well. So any of our Sika elastic parking deck membranes, we will require that, that you shot blast first to a three or four before continuing. Scarification is another popular one uh, to get a CSP again three to nine so that would fall within our range of, of, of hitting a csp of six so high pressure water blast so at least a 5,000 psi water blast if not higher or sand blasting can get you those, those higher csp numbers as well uh, a hammer drill with, uh, with a chisel bit on the end can also get you high csp numbers diamond grinding is also another way to, to reach those higher uh, csp numbers so those are all the surface prep numbers. So again, so far we've kind of covered, you've identified an area that needs to be repaired. You, you've chosen to go ahead and saw cut the perimeter. You've chipped out the bad concrete as well as the good concrete, because you do need to do that in order to get a simplified uh, repair you know, patch, like, like a simple rectangle. Um, and then you can use a number of different tools to kind of get you to that point. Now the next key stage is getting that concrete SSD. So what that means is surface saturated dry. And this will be on the CICA data sheet as well. So our technical data sheets on the second page towards the top will have a, under the surface prep, surface preparation heading, we'll reference this as well, right? So CICA's definition is an SSD surface is one that has been exposed to clean water until it can hold no more water. Then was allowed to air dry so no standing or glistening water is present. And then a cold damp surface is desirable. And I cry will kind of one up us and they'll, they'll get a little more technical and they'll, their definition is it's the condition of an aggregate particle or other pore solid when permeable voids are filled with water and no water is on the exposed surface. And the Portland Cement Association will chime in with, with, with their version as well, saying that it's a surface is SSD when neither absorbing water from nor contributing water to the concrete mixture. So we'll all have our different definitions, um, but to really simplify it, you need to wet down a concrete surface because concrete is like a sponge to the point where it can't accept any more water and there is still no standing water. You do not want to be showing up to do a repair mortar patch and finding that there's standing water or a little bird bass. We cannot have that. That would need to be removed before proceeding. So why is SSD so important? Why did I just take the time to kind of highlight three different definitions of, of the same thing. Well, um, it's it's critical because it will prevent the loss of moisture from a repair mortar during placement. 
Um, and if you do lose that moisture because you don't have an SSD surface, that can negatively affect adhesion uh, and performance characteristics of the repair material. And it will also prevent cracking of the repair material due to premature loss of moisture. You know, you could have, you could prep your concrete perfectly, choose the right uh, repair mortar, um, and still have issues. And, and one of the reasons why you may be having an issue is because the contractor, the person, is either unaware or they chose to skip the step of, of SSDing the surface. So again, that surface saturated dry, or sometimes we'll hear the word damp, doesn't really matter. Um, but it's a critical step. And then another note at the bottom here, you know, obviously in summer conditions when it's really hot, really windy, um, it becomes even more critical that you do not skip this step and that you take the time to do it properly. Uh, you know, I've been on job sites where, you know, I'll see a, a bucket of water and they'll have a paintbrush and they'll be kind of just, you know, what's kind of referred to as blessing the surface, um, which is just, you know, completely wrong. And that, that is not SSD because you can, you can spray concrete with water for two seconds and then turn around, turn back around to look at the surface and then that water is gone. So that concrete's not damp at all. And, and that does not classify as an SSD surface. So but now let's get in, now that we've talked about, you know, CSV profiles, what our expectations are, what iCry's expectations are, how to, you know, saw cut, define a patch, you know, prepare to the right CSV profile. You, you've got that surface SSD. Now you're ready to actually fill, fill that area in. So uh, basic concrete repair and protection systems comprise of one, a bonding bridge or bonding agent. Secondly, a rebar coating. And again, that's not to say that all of these are always necessary for every patch, but, but they could be. Uh, so again, rebar coating, then you move on to a repair mortar, and then finally, uh, surface protection. So from Sika standpoint, we have two main bonding agents. Uh, first and foremost, we have Sika Dirt 32 High Mod. So it's a two component solvent free, uh, high modulus, high strength, epoxy bonding adhesive. So you can see it here, A and a B, you mix them together. They come in 10 liter, 40 liter units. And then essentially it's as simple as painting it on the surface. And that will significantly increase the bond strength of your repair mortar. Second product, uh, and it's a little more popular because I'll, I'll highlight something here, one, one of its features, and that's our Sikatop Armatech 110 Eposem. Probably the longest winded Sika product name that we have, uh, but it's a three component water-based epoxy uh, resonant cement bonding agent and anti-corrosion coating. So it'll come in 8 kg and 25 kg units. Uh, one of the features that, that makes this product debatably a little more attractive is two things. One, it's a bonding agent and a corrosion inhibitor. Or Secure 32 is really just a bonding agent. Um, and the second feature of, of this product over the 32 is that the Armatech 110 is breathable. So you can use it in areas where you're confident you're going to have a vapor drive. Where this will be a, this is vapor impermeable because it's a pure epoxy. So again, these are our bonding agents if, if that's required. Um, it's always a good idea to use one of these, but sometimes they, they're, they're chosen for whatever reason not to be used. Um, and, and that's okay. Product selection. So what were the drivers of a product selection? How do you decide what repair and what you're going to use? You know, first and foremost, if, if what's specified, right? That's usually where everyone will start. Uh, the other critical deciding factor is what's the size and depth of repair that will limit and exclude certain products. Uh, method of placement. What makes the most sense? Is it, is it hand applied make the most sense? Is it form of core, form of pump? Um, these are seek as vertical. Uh, an overhead uh, repair mortar. So we have our Seeker Top 123 is probably hands down our most popular repair mortar across Canada. And it's a two component vertical uh, and overhead repair mortar. Uh, really well liked. It's probably on every, I think it's on every DOT list in the country. So DOT being an acronym for Department of Transportation. So that every province's approved product list, you'll, you'll find Seeker Top 123 on there. Um, and we have our, our we have a spray apply version with a 225 and a single component product here with 223. And then we have our sack and patch product and then our single component Sika Monotop 623F. I'm not going to go into all these in too much detail. But like I mentioned earlier, you can you can get a PDF copy of this presentation for your own records as well as please feel free and try and get comfortable with, with reaching out to your local Sika rep. Uh, we're here to help. That's what we get paid to do. Um, a, a big big service that we offer is, is tech support. So feel free to call us. No question is, is, is a bad question. Um, again, I can't stress it enough. Feel free to get comfortable with your local secret rep. 
Uh, horizontal concrete repair. We have a host of products as well. We have a Secret Top 122 is a very popular product. That, that's basically the horizontal, and it will do some vertical uh, version of the Secret Top 123. We have a host of other products here as well. Again, feel free to, to look at things uh, more closely once you have a PDF uh, presentation. We also have structural repair mortars as well. So if you've got a bridge deck, uh, you know, a parking, you're, you're working on a, a parking garage or a parkade, or you have a balcony, something like that. We have, again, a number of products here that will help uh, to repair your concrete. I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, King came into the Sika family uh, last year. They've been around for a very long time. They have a host of products, but they do have a couple products that fit in really nicely uh, with, with Sika's repair mortars. So I'm going to choose to highlight three King Sika repair mortars here. There's obviously much more than that, but uh, these are the three that, that probably impress me the most from their repair mortars specifically. First and foremost, King's RS S10 SCC. The SCC standing for self-consolidating uh, concrete. So what makes this what makes this product so special is that it has 10 millimeter aggregate in it, so you can go extremely deep uh, with this product. Um, the other critical feature of this product is that, excuse me, you you will reach 25 MPA uh, at three hours. Uh, so it's ideal for emergency form repairs of concrete beams, columns, soffits, uh, and shear walls. A uh, recent example, we actually sold quite a bit out uh, in the BC market because they were actually having to repair a concrete columns and then wrap it with our with our carbon fiber seeker wrap uh, as fast as they could because they were in a bit of a time crunch. So they wanted a product that they could apply to structurally restore these uh, columns and then have it set up as fast as possible so that then they could get on it as soon as possible with our carbon fiber wrap products called seeker wrap. So. A product like this allows you to do that. The other product is the RS S10. So it, it, it too has 10 mil aggregate in it and will get to 25 MPA at three hours. However, um, it's just, it's not a true SEC product and it's designed for horizontal repair applications. So a good, a good example would be, you know, highways, bridges, or parking garages. Um, and because of how it's formulated, you're actually able to uh, apply uh, a membrane uh, as soon as eight hours after the fact whether that's like an epoxy flooring membrane, or maybe it's a, a Seek Elastic 3900 series membrane. So that would be our parking deck membranes that you could be applying on it uh, within eight hours. So that's that's perfect for a contractor. If, if you had the surface prep done, you could show up in the morning, prep the patch, you know, make sure it's SSD properly, uh, surface preparation is CSP of six at a minimum, um, apply this product, and before you go home, you can be putting on your prime coat or your base coat for, for one of your uh, membranes. So it can really save you a lot of time. Third product here that I'm going to highlight before I move on is the RS S2. Uh, and it's pretty similar to, this, to the previous product. However, it's more for shallower repairs from 6 millimeters up to 50 millimeters. It too will get to 25 MPA at 3 hours. Um, and you'll, you can get on it with a membrane uh, as soon as uh, 8 hours. So again, this could be used for, for park aid applications as well. So if you have any questions about these King products, feel free to reach out to any of the Sika commercial construction employees uh, in Canada, and we'll gladly uh, help you out with these ones as well. Kind of moving on now, once you've, again, you, you've prepped your patch, it's SSD, you know what product you're gonna use, because you, you've talked to a Sika rep and or you, you've got a spec that you're working with, now you need to mix the product up. So you need to use, you know, an actual electric drill here. You cannot just be hand mixing these in a wheelbarrow or something. Uh, you want to get an RPM of, you know, 350 to 400 uh, plus a large mixing paddle of about, you know, a minimum of three inches, but preferably, preferably more like four or five inches in diameter. Uh, you get need a clean uh, uh, bucket and then you need a margin trowel. We'll get to the margin trowel in a second. So you would start, this would be an example of our Sika Top 122 or 123. You pour approximately 80% to 85% of the polymer. So that, it, it looks like kind of like diluted milk into the bottom of the clean pail. So again, start with the polymer in the bottom of the pail. Then you would add, you would slowly add all of the contents of the of the bag, so the cementitious material. Um, and then you would, you would start mixing for three minutes. Um, you want to stop at least once or twice during the mixing process to scrape down kind of the sides of, of the pail with, with the margin trowel. Um, and then you always want to hold back a little bit of the polymer so that you can then adjust 
uh, the product to get to a desired consistency. Obviously, you can't remove polymers, so you want to start with less. You know, less is more, and then kind of go from there. I already kind of went over this. Most of the secret products, you know, is the magical three-minute mix. Um, so the three minutes starts once all of the cementitious materials in, in the bottom of the pail with the liquid. Again, stop at least once, if not twice, to wipe the inside of the pail. So what wiping this area here, right, with your margin trowel. Replacing it, again, SSD, so surface saturated, dry or damp, uh, is critical. The other critical component is a scrub coat of the repair mortar into the substrate, uh, filling all the pores and voids. Uh, that scrub coat will be in, at about an eighth of an inch thick. So for a repair like this, you would actually just be using your hand. Obviously, with, with gloves on, you would take some of that product and you would you would kind of grind it into the surface of the entire patch. So you would grind it into the sides here, behind here, getting behind the rebar. And what that does is give you a, a good mechanical bond um, to the pores of the concrete and the, the existing substrate. You don't just want to slap material down onto an SSD surface. You want to first do a scrub coat, followed by filling in the patch. Again, critical that you press in behind the rebar here because you do not want to be left with this photo here, right? This void behind the rebar is obviously not what we want at all. Uh, this is an example of someone doing a scrub coat with our Seek Top 111 Plus. So they're going to resurface this area here of this condo um, and they're going to start with the scrub coat. So after the surface is SSD, we'll mix up product, pour it out onto the ground. Some will come by with like a stiff bristle broom and, uh, and scrub. Right, again, about an eighth of an inch into the surface, and then continue from there. So, finishing uh, hand applied mortars, uh, you want to completely fill the patch area, uh, which is should make sense. Uh, something else you want to do, here's a photo of a margin trowel, uh, is work the mortar from the center uh, to the outside of the patch. So, you're kind of forcing it into the existing concrete. As you can probably imagine, you don't want to be pulling from the outside with the perimeter of the patch in. That's just going to create a weak point because you're going to be pulling product away from the from the existing concrete. And finishing hand applied mortar. So after you filled it in, um, on our data sheets and the tech and the grayed out technical boxes, um, usually towards the top of the technical box, we'll have uh, like an application time, which is sometimes we'll, we'll refer to it as an application time, other times a pot life. That pot life means, okay, after you've mixed up the product, for example, with our Seeka Top 122, you've got 30 minutes to get that product out of the pail and onto the wall. Then we want to wait at least another 20 or 30, or sometimes even 40 minutes after that point before you start finishing. So we'll, we'll list an application time of 30 minutes, and then we'll list a finishing time of, I believe it's 45 minutes, or no, it's 50 minutes to an hour 15, right? So. Contractors should be aware of that, that there's two time frames. One, for getting the product onto the wall, and then two, there's another time to, to be finishing the product before you, you cure the product. Again, you can cure it a number of different ways, whether it's broom finish, trowel, you know, wooden trowel, uh, sponge float, something like that. So that's hand applied repair mortars. Now we're kind of jumping into form and pour uh, repair mortars like our Secrete 08 SCC. Again, the SCC stands for self compacted concrete. So you can form the area up uh, like they've done here and be pouring full walls with this product because you can go 18 inches thick. So as long as this wall here was 18 inches or, or thinner, you could, you could apply this product and do a whole, whole basement wall with this. Good example of where you'd want to do a form and pour, trying to fix this area with a hand applied repair mortar would, would be annoying so it's just easier to form the area up and pour the product in like that again all of all of form and pour products you can always form and pump them in it's just a, a different way to get the product in here this is overhead there's really no way to be for, forming this up and pouring it in unless you're going to be pouring it in from the top side which is sometimes done but if this was a bridge you're not going to be pouring through the top of the bridge um, you're going to be forming it up and pumping it in so we can, we can make specific pump recommendations. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll have a recommended pump manufacturer and model number for that manufacturer. But we'll also, we've also developed uh, personal relationships with uh, distributor sales reps for pump manufacturers. Um, you know, locally, again, I'm here in Calgary, all utilize uh, different distributors to distribute um, our you know, repair mortars uh, into the marketplace. And uh, they'll also be pump distributors, just like our distributors. So they'll 
there'll be pump manufacturers that will use uh, certain distributors to get their pumps out there. And they're really the experts in, in the uh, in the pumps and all the different pieces and everything like that. So we, we end up kind of deferring to, to what they'll recommend. This is an example of, again, of the underside of a bridge. So they form the area up. They've used a Sika boom here, which is our low expansion uh, Sika foam to uh, fill in any kind of little gaps or voids or kind of use it as a bit of a carpenter in a can is an expression. Um, they'll hook the equipment up and then they'll pump it in, remove the formwork, and you'll be left with that, right? This is a lot easier than trying to use a hand applied repair mortar overhead. And they'll kind of grind this area off here to blend it in. Um, and then they could, could even paint it with uh, one of our secret paints. Now we've kind of gotten to the stage where you, again, you, you've prepped the concrete, it's SSD, you selected a repair mortar, you applied it properly, you finished it properly. Now the other critical step is curing. So you need to cure repair mortars to prevent rapid uh, moisture loss at an early age, as well as to prevent loss of adhesion of repair mortars to the substrate. Um, and doing those first two things helps to ensure that the physical properties of the repair material stated on the product data sheet are achieved. Again, when you're looking in the technical box of our data sheets, um, all of our products are going to be cured at 23 degrees Celsius uh, per certain ASTM standards. Um, and if you, you as a contractor will say decide not to cure the product, you're not going to hit the performance uh, requirements as they're stated on our data sheet. They, they will obviously be less than that. How are you going to go about curing? Well, first and foremost, if you're permitted on the project and you're allowed to use one, just go ahead and use an approved uh, curing compound. Um, and again, we'll have a curing section on our technical data sheets. Usually towards the end of the second page of the data sheet, we'll have a section just labeled curing. Um, so we'll recommend our Sika Floor Seal WB. WB standing for water-based, 18 or 25 to cure your, your patch. Or you could use wet burlap or wet curing blankets. And at Sika, we'll have our Ultra Cure NCF and DOT curing blankets, so two different types. So if you're doing a whole bridge deck, you can use our curing blankets. Or if you're just doing, you know, repairing, you know, two feet by two feet, you, you could um, use our curing blankets as well. Or poly sheeting uh, is technically a way to, to help curing, but it's really not, never an approved you know, engineer recommended way. Something to note, a few of our products, uh, for our Sika Top products, like I mentioned, Sika Top 123 is extremely popular in Canada and in North America. Um, and we will, you know, outline this clearly on our data sheet that we only want to see these products wet cured for maximum 24 hours. So we, we want to see them wet. They should be cured, but if you do wet cure them, they should only be wet cured for 24 hours. After that, they do need to, to essentially kind of dry out and let that polymer dry out. Uh, that being said, you can choose to use an approved curing compound and then you're fine. But if you choose to go with like a wet curing blanket, we only want to see that on for 24 hours. Um, second note is our Sika Set 45, which is a magnesium phosphate, extremely fast setting. Uh, the 45 refers to 45 minutes, and you can be walking and driving on this product in 45 minutes after placing it down if it was on a bridge deck. Um, but we never want to see these wet cured. I had a recent example, I think it was beginning of this week or the end of last week, when uh, a general contractor came to me and said, hey, we've been using Seek Set 45. We just had it tested. We had an engineering company come out, test the product, um, and it's not hitting spec or not hitting your data sheet, what's going on? We talked, and we found out that they the testing company was coming to site, taking some of the product and, and wet curing it in a lime solution. And they actually got the 16 MPA at like, I think it was like 14 days when they should have been at somewhere around 45 MPA. Um, and that, that was because they wet cured it. We specifically said, do not wet cure this product. Um, they went ahead, wet cured it and, and kind of wondered why they weren't hitting their MPA strength. But, uh, it, it does, it just goes to highlight that, that, uh, whether you're a testing company, engineer, contractor, even myself, you, you do need to refer and rely on those data sheets and, and see what they're saying, as well as reach out to your, your seeker rep. Now let's move on to protective coatings. We've kind of covered the repair water section of the presentation, and we'll, we'll kind of finish up here for the next maybe 15, 20 minutes on some protective coatings. Uh, so I'll highlight our Seeker Guard SN40, which is our 40% silane, our Seeker Guard SN100, which is our 100% silane, and then our Sika Guard Color A50, which is basically you know, our pigmented sealer, or sometimes it's referred to as bridge paint. So type 1A, type 1B, and type 1C, and type 3, this is all referring to, to my province, Alberta. So this is, these are all our, uh, 
Alberta DOT, Department of Transportation approved uh, products. So what are we looking to achieve when you're using the first uh, two products? Um, so again, these first two products here, the S1040 and the SN100, um, we're looking for a reduction of water penetration into the concrete, a reduction of ingress of aggressive elements, so chlorides and sulfate, a reduction of steel reinforcement corrosion, uh, increasing of freeze thaw and de-icing salt resistance, um, and having no effect on water vapor permeability, meaning you need this concrete to be able to, to dry out. So by using those silane products, um, you will, again, the, the main, to simplify it, they will, you'll get less water penetration into your concrete um, and less dissolved chlorides uh, within those water molecules getting into your concrete, which has a lot of benefits. This is kind of how it works here. You've got your concrete substrate, you'll get a strong uh, bonding to the substrate and then you'll get a hydrophobic effect. So this is kind of the chemicals here, the silane molecules, and then we're showing here, it's like a, a water droplet uh, being repelled, but you're still allowing for water vapor uh, diffusion. So you're not having any issues with entrapping moisture. So this is how hydrophobic products work, right? They kind of, as we've mentioned before, and as you're probably aware, concrete's like a sponge. It has a series of little cracks and voids uh, within the surface uh, and throughout the concrete for that matter. So. You, these molecules, these silane molecules will attach themselves to the concrete and repel water. Whereas, you know, film forming products will just form the film here. And once this film has been eroded, then, then you're, you're left open to attack. How, would, how do you go about applying CK Guard SN100? And the same applies for CK Guard SN40. You need to start with a clean surface, whether that's light sandblasting or high pressure water wash. Then you need to let it dry. Uh, the drier, the better. Best results are achieved on 28 day old concrete. That's not to say that you, you can't apply them sooner, um, but consult a seeker rep if you are going to apply them sooner. Uh, you can apply them by brush, roller, or sprayer. By far, a sprayer or a little hand pump, you know, chafing sprayer is the best. Um, on vertical surfaces, you want to work from the top to the bottom. And horizontally, uh, it doesn't really matter with, which way you, you, you start with, but you, you want to make sure that there's no ponding on the horizontal surfaces and you want to watch out for wind or imminent rain. We have a dramatized photo here, but that's essentially what these products do. They, they do get pretty close to this in terms of repelling water. Um, so you're really going to extend the life of your concrete by spraying on these construction liquids. Uh, lastly here, um, uh, corrosion protection and inhibitor products. Uh, this is kind of a, a highlighting, a highlighting a phenomenon here where you've got, you know, chloride contaminated concrete. Uh, you've got maybe, maybe the concrete over here is worse than, than here on the left. And so you go in, you chip the concrete out, you, you apply a repair mortar patch. Um, and then because you've got such a difference between this new, new uh, concrete, uh, again, you, you, you've applied a repair mortar here and the existing contaminated uh, chlorided uh, concrete, these kind of abrupt changes in the concrete surrounding reinforcing steel um, will create a situation where it really speeds up the corrosion of uh, the, the rebar in this area here. So you, you want to watch out for that. One of the products that you can apply, um, well, there's two here. There's Sika Ferroguard 903 and 908. 908 is kind of the, the newer version. Um, so what are these products? They're liquid-based uh, mixed amino alcohol products, and they really serve two functions. Uh, first, they delay the onset of corrosion. Uh, and secondly, they reduce corrosion rates. So again, it is seen as part of a concrete repair and protection system. So how it works is penetrating the concrete. It will be absorbed onto the steel. You know, form a chemical film and it will protect reinforcement by controlling corrosion rates. So when you spray these liquids on, they basically migrate um, to the rebar and create uh, basically almost like a, a coating or protective layer around the rebar. And we've done tests uh, and had third party testing done. And this will be on uh, our, our Ferroguard data sheets, uh, but a little more specifically on the 908 data sheet, which has some silane in it as well. Um, where we've done tests and on one piece of concrete, um, it hasn't been treated. And on another piece of concrete beside it, it's been treated with Sika Ferroguard 908. Um, and the reduction in corrosion rates are pretty staggering. Using the 908, you will get a reduction in corrosion from a minimum of, of 87%, we found, upwards to 99%. So virtually no corrosion when you use a Ferroguard uh, 908. And we can, again, feel free to reach out to us if you have more questions about, about these products. So I'm kind of wrapping up here. I've got maybe another 10 minutes left. But I, I wanted to take the time to give a little bit of a, of a PSA, right? So public service announcement. I, I find a lot of, uh, I 
find these terms are kind of used interchangeably sometimes from a uh, design standpoint, but from Sika standpoint as a manufacturer, um, we, we definitely don't see these terms as interchangeable. We see them as kind of distinct and unique. So for, for grouts and repair mortars, they're, they're kind of two different, they're definitely two different Sika products. So our Sika grout, like our Sika grout 212 is, is extremely popular across Canada. Um, and this is kind of a perfect example of where you'd use it, right? Let's say you've got a concrete pedestal here. You're going to mechanically fasten your column here. Let's say it's in a warehouse. And uh, then you're going to form the area up and pour in Secret Grout 212 as a grout to support this, this static load. So as you can see, uh, our grouts uh, are designed for use where a majority of the product surface is confined on all sides during curing, right? So it's confined by the, the pedestal here, the column up here, and then the formwork around it. That's how we see our secret grip 212 is, is this is primarily how it should be used. Our repair mortars, like let's say it's Sika Top 122 or Sika Set 45 or Sika Crete 08 SCC, they're designed to be applied with a significant portion of the product unconfined and exposed. So this whole patch, right, this the majority of it is, is exposed. So if you were to use Sika Grab 212 in this application, you are running the risk that as the product uh, expands slightly to be non shrink um, it doesn't come in contact with the surface, like in this photo here. If it doesn't come in contact with this uh, with this column here, the, the, the top of it, then you open yourself up to the possibility of, of small kind of uh, hairline cracking occurring, which will obviously weaken the patch and, and reduce its service life. So again, we see growths in repair mortars as, as completely different products and not to be used uh, interchangeably. Just want to talk about now concrete cracks. Uh, so the number one question to ask yourself if you're looking at a concrete crack, and again, they're important to address because if, if you leave them alone, just like that kind of second slide that I highlighted with, with a vehicle, if you just leave that alone, that little kind of rust spot on your vehicle can eventually balloon into, you know, a severe, severe issue and cracks are much the same way. You need to address them early so that they don't become larger and become a more significant issue. So the first question to ask yourself is, do you expect movement in the crack? If the answer is no, um, you would go with our structural epoxy injections. If the answer is yes, you would need to go with a polyurethane or, or uh, acrylate injection resin. So dealing, if, if the answer is no, and it's just a structural epoxy injection you're looking for, that's when you'd want to go with our, with our Secadur line. So Secadur is kind of like Secaflex, right? It's the umbrella term, and within that, uh, numerically, we categorize a host of other products like Secadur 35, Secadur 52. Um, they all have different features and they all have different viscosities and, and other different uh, uh, benefits. So it, it it really depends upon the, the crack and the situation um, as to which product uh, you want to use. So they're for preventing water ingress to reinforcing steel and you'll extend your life as well as they'll facilitate load transfer. And again, it, it's seen as an essential part of a comprehensive concrete restoration project. Surface prep, you want to, again, measure the crack width so that you know that'll start to dictate which product you can use. Some products, you know, have a maximum, you know, crack width of two millimeters or six millimeters, or, or, or maybe it's, it's larger, right? So you want to know that. Then you want to grind the surface to remove unbonded and weak surface material, which is what we're doing here. Then you want to vacuum up all that dust. Um, and you may be asking yourself, you know, I'm just trying to inject this crack. Why am I dealing with the surface? Um, and you're dealing with that because it will promote good bonding of the capping materials um, and your your ports to inject your products, which you'll see in a second. So the, these ports here, uh, Secret will sell some. Um, and then there's other companies that will sell them as well. Um, so contractors can easily get these. Um, so you want to center the hole over the crack. Um, and then you'll want to use a, a capping paste um, to essentially glue them down. And then you'll want them spaced out every kind of four to six inches, depending upon the, the viscosity of the product you're using and the width of the crack. And then you want to apply your capping paste over the face of uh, the crack here. You know, kind of cover it up, almost creating a skin over the crack so that you don't get the epoxy coming back out the top of the crack. You want it going down uh, into the crack this way. And then you want to let that epoxy set up. Then you can then you need to drive in uh, your selected Secadur product. So it could be electrically driven, cordless gun, could be manually or could be pneumatically driven as well. So some good examples here of uh, shear cracks on girders uh, being addressed with a structural epoxy. And again, obviously it doesn't look great, but typically then what's done after this fact they they're they're ground the face of them are ground 
flush with the surrounding concrete and then typically you'll, you'll choose to cover everything up with like a bridge paint like our secret guard uh, a50 last couple slides here and then we'll, we'll wrap things up um but what if you're looking at a crack and, and you know you have either you know you're gonna have movement or there's active water leaks coming in like these two guys have found them, themselves in, in a bad situation um that's when you want to use different products so if, if you have an active highly flowing water leak like that last photo was shown you want to use our our our, uh, our Sika fix line so our Sika fix pu or the hh plus or the hhlb so these are polyurethane grouse that are almost like foam that as soon as you they hit water they just react and kind of balloon up and they'll plug that crack so you can stop an active water leak under hydraulic pressure with these Sika fix products or if you're looking to address kind of dry or damp or even slightly wet cracks and or cracks that you think are going to be moving in the future that's where you want to use our Sika injection whether it's the 307 310 or 215 products these are the these are the acrylic products uh, that are great for that that will allow for flexible uh, a little bit of movement in those cracks so again i know this is a lot of information at once you'll, you'll get the pdf copy of the presentation as well as again very stressed it quite a bit, but, but feel comfortable reaching out to, to us. Um, if you're in the Alberta area or even anywhere across Canada, feel free reaching out to me and I can uh, begin to help you out with the selecting the right product. Um, typical repair locations, you know, leaking and moving cracks, uh, construction joints uh, here. And these are all examples of where you could be using the, the previous slides products like our Sika Fix or our Sika Injection products. Honeycombed concrete, cold joints, expansion joints, pipe joints, pipe uh, intrusions, pretty much anywhere below grade where, where you've got some voids or some cracks uh, that you're looking to, to fill because again, you have uh, water coming in under pressure or you're gonna expect movement. That's where you can use uh, uh, those other products. So that concludes my presentation today. Uh, I really thank you for taking the time to attend my presentation. Um, again, I will gladly send you a, a PDF copy of the presentation. Um, so just send me an email when you get a moment. Um, I'll sign off here in the next couple of seconds and then please let our marketing team log out so that we can record you being in the presentation um, and you can get your learning credit. So again, thanks and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.